Well, with the coronavirus, it seems I have a little time on my hands. The coffee shop's a little slow today, and I thought I'd sneak back and make a video. Welcome. I sure hope all of you are doing well, uh, hopefully enjoying the better parts of this situation we all find ourselves in. Perhaps getting a little well-needed rest and time away from work. Maybe spending time with loved ones. I do still think there's something else going on other than what they tell us. And I'm optimistic that something good may come of this. But today, as my personal distraction, I wanted to look at a few random subjects. First of all, I find myself looking at the horse and buggy. The means for moving people and equipment, materials, all throughout the old world. And really, of course, seeming ridiculous that one could build these amazing structures of the past using mere horsepower. But in today's exploration, I wanted to have a look at something a little more impossible seeming than building one of these buildings, what we would call a Tartarian building. Today, I wanted to have a little look at the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal is a canal in New York, formerly known as the New York State Barge Canal. Originally, it ran 363 miles from the Hudson River in Albany to Lake Erie in Buffalo. It was built to create a water route from New York City and the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes. When completed in 1825, it was the second longest canal in the world after the Grand Canal in China. And here a little look at the Grand Canal, very grand. The canal was first proposed in 1780, then re-proposed in 1807. So mind you, our country is officially created in 1776, officially. And here a short time later, 1780, they're proposing building canals. And again, let's just have a little look at how you're going to build this canal. And you're not digging a canal like this by hand. Now they'll have us believe that horse and some sort of dredging equipment will have been used. And eventually its construction began in 1817. The canal has 34 locks and has an elevation difference of about 565 feet. It opened in 1825. Boom. About eight years. Eight years in the early 1800s to construct a canal of 363 miles in a time when bulk goods were limited to pack animals and there were no railways, water was the most cost-effective way to ship bulk goods. It was faster than carts pulled by draft animals and cut transport costs by about 95 percent. It was enlarged between 1834 and 1862. The canal's peak year was 1855, when 33,000 commercial shipments took place. There's our little tip-off. And in present time, the canal has been mainly used as a recreational watercraft since the retirement of the last large commercial ship in 1994. The canal saw a recovery in commercial traffic in 2008. And here a look at an aqueduct over the Mohawk River. Just to give an idea of the complexity of this canal, and this is no crude canal. Again, complete with locks to accommodate for the change in elevation, complete with stonework, brickwork, different passages. Again, with the use of horse and primitive tools, we're to believe that it could even be possible to build a canal of 350 plus miles. And just to get an idea of the effectiveness of horse and buggy, we're told in the first decade of the 19th century, shipping goods from Albany pre-railroad was a very tedious affair. And to cover the distance from Buffalo to New York City by stagecoach took two weeks. Two weeks from Buffalo to New York City. Now, if you could imagine trying to trek across the country, let's say you had an appointment to attend the World's Fair in San Francisco, and you lived in New York City, 
you just might not make it. I don't know what they're expecting us to believe. These miraculous feats created by primitive means. The problem was that the land rises about 600 feet from one end to another, from the Hudson to Lake Erie. Locks at the time could handle up to 12 feet of lift. So even with the heftiest cutting and viaducts, 50 locks would be required along the 360 mile canal. Such a canal would be expensive to build even with modern technology. In 1800s, the expense was barely imaginable. President Thomas Jefferson called it little short of madness and rejected it. There was much opposition and the project was ridiculed as Clinton's folly. In 1817, Clinton received approval from the legislature for $7 million to construct the canal. The channel was cut 40 feet wide and 4 feet deep, with removed soil piled on the downhill side to form a walkway known as the Town Path. Here we see a little look at the town path, seeming as if it's a brick or stone. Very clean edge, and perhaps some of the workhorses used to clean out and shape this miraculous canal. Its construction through limestone and mountains proved a daunting task. In 1823, construction reached the Niagara, creating the necessity to build five locks along a three-mile corridor. Here we go. To move earth, animals pulled a slip scraper, similar to a bulldozer. The sides of the canal were lined with stone set in clay, and the bottom was also lined with clay. The stonework required hundreds of German masons, who later built many of New York's buildings. All labor of the canal depended upon human and animal power, or the force of water. Engineering techniques developed during its construction included the building of aqueducts to redirect water. One aqueduct was 950 feet long to span 800 feet of river. As the canal progressed, the crews and engineers working on the project developed expertise and became a skilled labor force. So just figuring it out as they go. And here a little look at the profile of the original canal. Again, minding the elevation changes, not just building a canal through the same elevation. 360 miles of changing elevation. Very impressive, even today. And here a little rendering in 1839. A little idea of what these people may have dressed like, according to the false narrative, and some of their handiwork in the background here, and of course their canal very proud perhaps having a day off in this depiction and again construction the men who planned and oversaw the construction were novices there were no civil engineers in the united states they made do with what they had and they used a couple of judges whose experience in surveying was usually just settling boundary disputes but they stepped up to the plate this man is said to have only rehearsed using the survey equipment a few hours before the canal's construction. Yet these men carried the Erie Canal up the Niagara and maneuvered it into a towering embankment to cross over several rivers, even carving out a route in solid rock. And everything worked as planned. The main delays were caused by felling trees to clear a path along the virgin forest and moving excavated soil, which took longer than expected, but the builders devised a way to solve these problems. Using a scraper and a plow, a three-man team with oxen, horses, and mules could build a mile in a year. The remaining problem was finding labor. Many of the laborers working on the canal were Irish. Here, let's have a little look in 1855, the Erie Canal, similar to the other picture we just saw and of course mind you that these people are also supposed to be building these impressive buildings this style we're so familiar with with a shortage of labor at the very beginning of the inception of this nation here a little look at an aqueduct over nine mile creek in camillus new york built in 1841. you know forget about excavating and just digging a canal. There is so much more that goes into this canal. Bridges and locks and naturally quarrying stone. 
and in some cases what looks like concrete. All done by very primitive people. And here a little look in 1890. Another little aqueduct, little canal passing over the top, and again, just mind you, the cities themselves. How is this even possible? And personally, I don't believe it for a minute. I'll let you be the judge of that. Just thought I would share, and let's have a little look at something else. Next, I wanted to have a little look at this Dome of the Rock. And not just the Dome of the Rock, but the Dome of the Rock has something very significant inside of it. This was shared with me today in a comment. I thank you for the share. And it originally brought me to this video by this Antoine Daniels. A very interesting video. I'll leave the link for you. Looks like it was shared February 3rd in 2017. And what this channel has done is shown us a little look at the inside of this Dome of the Rock. And what we see is is this on the inside. It looks like the whole thing is built around these stones. And when we look at these stones from above, what we see is a shape or an outline very similar to the United States, at least the western half. And just mind-blowing, is this a representation of our realm? I'm not sure, but I do encourage you to check out his video. Ultimately, he overlays the western part of the United States on top of this rock feature, and we have a striking similarity. Not at all what I was expecting to look into this morning, but I found it absolutely fascinating. And I'm not sure if I agree with the channel's theory at this point, but honestly, I'm not sure if he even agrees. Just an idea, and very interesting. And this is the first time I've ever had a look inside this dome of the rock. Just the construction of the building is impressive enough, but what is going on with this truly? And again, this is uh, about three years ago, and he's showing the similarities with the One World Trade Center and an old Muslim mosque. And we see a striking similarity to the technology used today and being very similar in the past. And here again, tech, tech, and tech. And here I wanted to talk about the good book for a moment. And I do love the teachings and the wisdom found within the book itself, but I've never put that much stock in Revelation until recently, until these times that we're experiencing right now. And we're told about a thousand years of peace and glory, and at its conclusion, Satan is to be let out for a short time to reign only to be put away for good, followed by another episode of peace. And this thousand years is what really stuck out in my mind. When we look at the history of North America, what we see is that these structures seem to be up to a thousand years old. And what if there was a period of a thousand years of peace? What would it look like? A period where we progressed unhindered by it dark forces. Perhaps this is what we call the Tartarian era. And what if the thousand years of peace had already happened? And what we see is these unified buildings found throughout our plane, more impressive and beyond the abilities of anything we create today. And perhaps this last 200 years was referring to this revelation. Perhaps this was not a prophecy, but something that had already come to pass. And here in our recent times, in our inherited times, we live in a lie. Everything flip-flopped, completely misunderstood, and this being the metaphorical time or rule of Satan. A time where money and time itself dominate our lives. And what we're seeing in this current situation is a breakdown. A complete breakdown of the power structure. And of course, I don't know. But I only bring this up to simply propose the idea. Are we coming to the close of this corrupt system and now understanding our history and ready to recreate the world to our likings? Seeing with eyes wide open and in a position to restructure our lives based on things that matter. And finally, I wanted to apologize for my last video. Uh, it was ultimately removed by YouTube, and I was hit with a copyright strike, 
and since the video was unviewable, I went ahead and deleted it thinking it would remedy the copyright, which it did not. But I thank you for all the amazing comments, and I typically feel as if people are okay sharing their work in this community of truth, but in that particular case, it was clear from the beginning that this creator was not okay with sharing their work based on requests and the description in her video. I did not copy the work. I only read a series of questions and a very sad day if a series of questions can be the property of copyright. And perhaps one day at this rate we'll no longer be allowed to ask questions. I do hope you got to watch it and I encourage you to share it out if you had the opportunity to download it. But for today, I think that's it. I do thank you for joining me, and look forward to exploring some more topics soon. I hope you're faring well through all of this, and encourage you to cling to the possibility of a good outcome. So for now, do have a blessed day, and please like, comment, and subscribe.